coffee. Coffee no! <laughs> There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to the program One Hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Before I jump into today's news headlines, I have an important announcement for everybody who listens to True News on World Band International Shortwave radio stations. As you know, shortwave frequencies typically are adjusted in the fall and spring of each year. As of today, World Harvest Radio is telling me there will not be any changes this month for their frequencies, World Harvest Radio. Therefore, True News will continue to be heard at the same time on the same frequencies on World Harvest Radio. Those frequencies are 5920 and 9860. Now, I've learned over the years that could change in the next two weeks. But as of right now, World Harvest Radio is telling us the FCC is not changing their frequencies Uh, for the fall of this year. WWCR, however, uh, will have new frequencies at the end of this month. Starting on Monday, October 28, our 6 p.m. Eastern Time broadcast will be on frequencies 5070 and 6115. Again, this change only affects our 6 p.m. Eastern Time broadcast on WWCR. The new frequencies will be 5070 and 6115. 5070 and 6115 will be the new frequencies at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on WWCR starting Monday, October 28th. Well, as it stands today, Barry Sotoro will get everything he demanded from the Congress. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell unveiled a plan today that will reopen the federal agencies, fund the government through January, and suspend the debt ceiling through early February. It's important that you understand that word suspend. And um, we're still trying to verify uh, if, if they are lifting the debt ceiling or suspending it. My hunch is it will be a suspension. It's a big difference between lifting the ceiling and suspending the ceiling. If you lift the ceiling, well, there's another limit. If you suspend the ceiling, the sky is the limit. And they've done this before. Uh, For Mr. Obama, they suspended the debt ceiling, and he had a blank check to borrow all the money he could borrow. I think that's what they've done again. Uh, The bill does not delay the start of Obamacare. Nor does it require the members of Congress to obey Obamacare. In fact, they will get tax subsidies to defray the cost of participating in Obamacare. So we will have to pay the bill for them uh, to have the very best health care plans under Obamacare. We will subsidize it, but then we will have to pay for our own plans under Obamacare. Of course, I'm going to opt out. I'm not going to participate in this fascist operation. Uh, Texas Republican Senator Ted Cruz said he would not attempt to block a vote on the deal. He said at this point there's nothing to be gained. House Republican leaders hinted it will pass in the House uh, with uh, 
Democratic Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi delivering all 200 of the House Democratic votes, plus some moderate Republicans. There are 232 Republicans in the House. That means 16 or more Republicans must vote with the Democrats to pass the debt ceiling increase. Meanwhile, the U.S. territorial government of Puerto Rico denies it is near bankruptcy or that it may need a bailout from Washington. Puerto Rican Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla assured investors today that Puerto Rico will not default on its bonds despite the island's $820 million budget deficit. Amnesty for millions of illegal immigrants is Barry Sotoro's next goal. Just like I predicted. A confident Barry Sotoro said that he will push for an immediate vote in the House on the Senate's bill that will legalize 11 million illegal immigrants. And once again, I assure you of this. Speaker John Boehner and Nancy Pelosi will deliver the House votes to pass the illegal amnesty bill. The fix is in. John Boehner is either bought off or severely compromised. He works for the Obamanistas. He will get the job done. And uh, if you think it can't happen, or oh, just watch. They're going to pass the illegal amnesty bill. Kiss the country goodbye. Because not only will they legalize the tens of millions of illegals, and they, you know they, they say 11 million, but I think anybody in their right mind knows it's far more than 11 million in the country. Not only are they going to legalize them, but the door is going to be wide open for millions more to come flooding over the borders. And they'll be legalized, too. And so the, the fix is in. The Republicans are in bed with the Democrats. It's one party, and they both work for the same bunch of crooks and thieves. As of 5 p.m., uh, today, as I record this program, it, it appears the debt ceiling bill will pass the House tonight or in the morning. Of course, as the old saying goes, the opera ain't over till the fat lady sings. So if there's going to be more drama tonight or tomorrow and the bill is narrowly defeated, then it is certain Barry Sotoro will assume dictatorial powers and authorize the Treasury Department to raise the debt ceiling without an act of Congress. I'm not positive that's not going to happen yet. Very, very possible. That still could happen. So we'll know in the next 24 hours. California, well, you know, quite frankly, he's already a dictator. And this wasn't a government shutdown. This was a smackdown. He smacked down the few congressmen that dared to stand up against him. The media working hand in hand with the White House made sure that the public did not understand what's at stake. And, uh, you know, there really has been no debate on the insanity of spending trillions of dollars that we don't have. Uh, I mean, if you listen to the... It really is insane. He, he Honestly, Mr. Obama really is mentally ill. Uh, because what he has said repeatedly for weeks and weeks and weeks is that if you do not allow me to spend more borrowed money. I'm going to default on the government debt. Now, you think about this. Imagine going into the bank where you have your house mortgage and telling the banker, if you don't loan me more money to pay my mortgage payments, I'm telling you I'm going to default. So you better loan me more money. That's really the argument that they've made. It's insane. The the guaranteed default that's coming is because the country is $17 trillion in debt and borrowing more. That's what's going to cause the default. Uh, I'm going to take a break, and uh, when I come back, my, uh, my guest will be here, Dr. Grady McMurtry, and uh, he's from Creation Worldview, and we will talk about the link between evolution, eugenics, and population control right here on True News. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Rick will return after this announcement.
This is Max McLean. Why does God discipline us? Listen to the Bible from Hebrews 12. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. From Hebrews 12, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. You're listening to True News, your Christian alternative source for global news, analysis, and information. I'm Rick Wiles. You know, most of this radio audience knows that the mainstream news media cannot be trusted to report the truth, and most of our listeners have known uh, for years that generally the the mainstream news media presents a leftist, socialistic, anti-Christian worldview on news and world events. But I think a smaller number of people are truly aware that the real danger posed by the mainstream news media is not their leftist bent on the news. It is the agenda that they are advancing that you really need to be concerned about because they have. What they have in mind for us is not good. Uh, They aren't merely a group of dim-witted buffoons with fluffy hairdos and big salaries to match their big egos. Uh, They're working for a shadow elite, and they have a very nasty agenda in mind for the rest of us. Let me give you an example Uh, Recently, you know, several weeks ago, remember the U.N. uh, released their big uh, report on global warming, uh, the U.N. panel on climate change or whatever it's called. And there was a report on CNN. And I I watched uh, uh, I watched it on online uh, and I was just watching the the propaganda techniques. Uh, The CNN anchor woman said the U.N. had just released and she called it the blockbuster report. On global warming. And then she said it was the most thorough study ever done on the subject. Of course, she didn't mention that there's been no warming of the planet for the past uh, 17 years. And she didn't mention that her global warming scientific gurus are at a loss to explain the absence of warming temperatures. They merely say global warming has paused, but it will get worse when it restarts. The truth is there is mounting evidence that we've entered a long-term cooling cycle. Sunspots have almost disappeared. And uh, some scientists, very esteemed scientists around the world, are saying that this cooling cycle may last 40 to 200 years. Okay, uh, back to the CNN propaganda report. The, The anchor woman said the U.N. climate panel concluded that global warming is real. And there is near certainty among scientists that human beings are to be blamed for it. CNN.com posted on its website, along with um, the video of their report uh, about global warming, they posted an article written by Alan Wiseman. He's the author of the book Countdown, Our Last Best Hope for a Future on Earth. His previous book was A World Without Us. The essence of his article said the world population will add another billion humans in the next 12 years. Global warming is threatening the planet. Greenhouse gases must be reduced to save the planet. The safest, I mean the fastest and easiest way to reduce global warming and save the planet is to reduce the human population. That's the zinger I want you to see. Mr. Wiseman proposed a number of draconian steps to make it difficult or impossible for families to have more than one or two children. The bottom line is he is advocating eugenics and forced population reduction. And CNN is right there helping him to spread the propaganda and set the stage for the public to accept 
the Population Reduction Plan. Well, Dr. Grady McMurtry is the president and founder of Creation Worldview, and uh, they're located uh, here in the beautiful state of Florida. They're just about an hour and a half away from us in, in Orlando. The website is creationworldview.org, and he's on the phone right now. Uh, he's traveling. He's in the state of Maryland where he's speaking. Uh, Dr. McMurtry, uh, welcome to True News. Well, good afternoon, sir. A pleasure to meet you. Yes, sir. Well, are you surprised that CNN would put out a report like that? Well, you know, when I founded Creation Worldly Ministries, we founded it, to, of course, to propagate the information concerning creation scientifically, biblically versus evolution. I was an evolutionist. And I'm a full-time teaching missionary, so I go to not only the United States, but to many countries, and we refer to CNN as Communist News Network, of course. And, of course, CNN is going to promote this sort of thing because they're committed to an evolutionary worldview. They're committed to this kind of dogma that people are the problem and, indeed, a zero population or negative population growth based in an evolutionary Malthusian sort of world that they live in. Well, I'm in agreement with you. Is it is CNN? You know, it's it's uh, always been to me the communist news network. Um, you know, they proudly display the flag of the United Nations in front of their headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. It's been waving in front of the CNN facility for decades, and of course, the founder of CNN, Ted Turner, a long time proponent of population reduction. And uh, several years ago, I think it was about. Oh, I don't know, 2000, uh, could have been uh, 8, 9, 10, sometime in there. Uh, Mr. Turner and a group of other billionaires met uh, together uh, to to um, talk about pooling their resources together to advance the population reduction strategy. And the point I'm trying to get across here is that to the audience is these people mean business. They really want to force the human population to be reduced. And uh, it, it's frightening to think what would happen if they ever get their way. Well, you see, they believe that people are a cancer on the earth, and they worship their mother goddess Gaia, the earth goddess, uh, of 2,000 years ago. There's nothing new about this. And so they really consider people to be a cancer on the land. I, I find it quite interesting. Um, I read an article where... Uh, there were some evolutionists, um, these type of people, who uh, had pictures taken by satellite of Peoria, Illinois. And they um, showed what it looked like in an early satellite photograph uh, taken back in the early 70s. And then they showed another photograph of them taken some 30-odd years later with a newer satellite. And uh, the city, of course, had expanded. It had grown. And they said, look... It looks just like a cancer that is spreading in the body, you know, that the people are the problem. Well, the truth of the matter is liberals are the problem. I, I wrote an article on my website uh, where I talk about there is no one more cruel than a liberal. The fact of the matter is, for instance, when it comes to global warming, global cooling, it is impossible for human beings to heat the earth or cool the earth. There's nothing we could possibly do. And if you simply took a Christian approach for it, first of all, there's about 36 verses of the Bible where God says he's in charge of the weather. Uh, specifically, we might take a look in Genesis 8 or Amos 4, uh, where he says he uses weather to chastise and to bless. He can make it rain on one side of the street and not on the other. So God is in charge of the weather, and humans cannot manipulate it. Any weather cycles we see are through natural events. I, I I agree with you. Um, so uh, how how far along do you think this uh, population reduction strategy uh, agenda really is? Do you, uh, are, do you think these guys are still um, in the stage of of hoping that they can bring it about, or uh, are they really farther along than what we realize? When you add in abortion and sterilization. And uh, a lot of other things that have that are underway around the world. The truth is, the population reduction agenda ha- has been going f- fully funded and supported for decades. 
Well, it goes back to, of course, Sanger, and even before her, when you go back to Oliver Wendell Holmes, Associate Chief Justice of the United States, the concepts of euthanasia, of abortion, of population reduction, or eugenics, which is what we're really talking about, uh, go back to the cousin of Charles Darwin, Francis Galton. Uh, Francis Galton took Charles Darwin's ideas on evolution and applied them to the Earth's population and said, for instance, that only intelligent, highly educated people should even be allowed to reproduce, that the lower people, the less economically advantaged, the less educated, should not even be allowed to propagate. Uh, this led, of course, to Oliver Wendell Holmes promoting eugenics, and um, in the early 1900s would lead to the sterilization, incorrectly, inappropriately, of people even in the United States, uh, based on totally false information. But these people are very serious. Um, there are women in the UK, in the United Kingdom, England, who have actually aborted their babies because they believe that they didn't want to bring any more children into the world that would use up resources. They believed that global warming people were telling the truth. Now, there's everything and anything you want in science to prove that global warming is not true and that this was utterly unnecessary, but that's the degree to which they are brainwashed into believing it. I, I believe that when Al Gore and others were trying so hard to get a carbon um, credit transaction system going, which, by the way, was was uh, invented by Enron, of all companies. But I think when they were trying to get this carbon uh, credit transaction system implemented in the world, I think what they had in mind was that uh, people would be punished for having children. Others would be rewarded for not having children. And it would be based on on how many carbon credits you earned, and and I really believe this was this was part of the plan that they were going to promote a plan where parents were going to be told, you know, you're destroying the planet, and you could actually benefit financially by not having any children. And fortunately, that that whole carbon credit scheme fell apart. And But it, we were very close to it a couple of years ago to seeing that plan come into fruition. If you remember, the Lord, the Lord gave them a snowstorm in Copenhagen you know, when they were having their 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 global warming uh, conference. What was that? Two thousand ten. You know, they had a blizzard in Copenhagen, shut the thing down. So, um, uh, but you know, they keep trying. And uh, but but, Doctor, how? Um, Going back to eugenics and and Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood, uh, talk to our audience about the connection to those people and those thoughts and those philosophies and how that was brought into German, into the German Nazi Party, into the Third Reich. Well, of course, that came through an American scientist that was given the credit for for applying eugenics in the United States, but. The whole concept, first of all, goes back to Charles Darwin and Darwinian evolution. Uh, the basic concepts of survival of the fittest, natural selection, which actually do not promote evolution but promote creation, and the application of that to social Darwinism, as it was called. And the fact of the matter is Charles Darwin was a flaming racist. He believed whites were vastly more evolved, vastly superior to any dark-skinned people. That was picked up by Charles uh, Francis Galton, his cousin. It was picked up by Oliver Wendell Holmes. And Sanger specifically came up with Planned Parenthood as a way of killing black babies to prevent blacks from reproducing because she believed in white superiority. So you really go from Charles Darwin to Francis Galton to Oliver Wendell Holmes to Margaret Sanger, and the efforts by Planned Parenthood were totally racist in nature. And isn't it isn't it ironic that today the overwhelming majority of black pastors politically support the people who are financing with tax dollars Planned Parenthood and that organization is deliberately murdering black babies. 
Well, yes, but then the NAACP and other uh, people in the black community who are considered to be leaders, you know, uh, we could name people specifically, Jesse Jackson, uh, we could name others, but they are intentionally, through the acceptance of evolutionary belief, through Darwinian belief, trying to keep their people down, oppressed, thinking that they are inferior. Because, again, evolution teaches that there's a superior and an inferior, whereas creation, Christianity, well, we teach that there's an equality of all people. In Christianity, in creation, there is actually only one human race with people of different ethnic appearances. This occurred because of the separation of the population at the time of the Tower of Babel into 70 inbreeding groups, which produced the ethnicity that we see today. The creations teach the equality of all people, regardless of their ethnicity or appearance. It is evolution that teaches racism. If you want to stop racism, all you have to do is stop teaching evolution. But I once was uh, a witness um, before a school board to get creation taught scientifically, not vividly, in one of the counties of Florida. And I actually enlisted thinking that uh, the NAACP would like to actually do something good for their people and teach that they are not inferior. So I went and asked for their support by asking them to bring people, you know, to sit on, so to speak, our side of the aisle when we were making our presentations and was told flat out, why would you want to do that? If I did that, I'd lose my job. They intentionally want to keep their people uh, actually submissive, keep them in what they believe to be inferior, because that's the way they make a living. And I think that explains it right there. It's the way they make their living. Um, regarding... Um the size of the human population, uh, you know, the, the, the evolutionists tell us that the, the earth is, uh, you know, millions, possibly billions of years old. If, if, if their theory were, was correct, then what would the population of the planet be today? In terms of... Uh the population from an evolutionary standpoint? Yes. I mean, they, they, they tell us, yeah, I mean, they tell us that the planet is, you know, is, you know, hundreds of millions, some say billions of years old. Well, just by doing the math of, of, of the yes. spread of the human population, I, I, where, where should we think, be at today? I think what you're referring to is called population dynamics. Mm -hmm. And, and I'd like to point out to people, you can disprove evolution easily by just doing the mathematics. Now, evolutionists, of course, do teach about millions and billions. I used to be an evolutionary teacher. I did teach it myself, much to my chagrin today. But I am now a creationist. I believe in 6,000-year-old Earth. The thing is, though, if you were to take simple mathematics, evolutionists claim people evolved from apes 4 million supposed years ago, that they have been recognizable as actual human beings for roughly 1 million supposed years. Now, if that's true, how long is a generation? Well, today you're lucky if it's 20 years, but let us be very conservative and say it's 40 years. So no children for 40 years. Well, divide 1 million by 40, you will get 25,000 generations. Now, of course, where are the artifacts? Where are the tools? Where is the jewelry? Where are the bodies? You know, you could stack the whole solar system full of dead bodies if that were the case. The fact of the matter is, there's only been approximately a little over 200 generations since Adam and Eve. And, of course, the human population started back over again with only three pairs only 4,350 years ago. You can easily get a 7 billion population today in only a little over 4,000 years at a growth rate that is far below the replacement rate. That is, you know, the replacement rate is uh, a pair of parents has at least two and a quarter children uh, for zero population growth. Well, the fact of the matter is you can get the entire Earth's population in a few thousand years from even one pair of human beings to begin with at about a half a percent per generation. 
So the population is growing very rapidly, far beyond replacement rates, uh, and we've got the human population we have today in only a few thousand years. You can imagine if you were given a million years in 25 or let's say it's 20 years to a generation, that would be 50,000 generations. Compare that to slightly over 200 that we have today. Doctor, why, why is it important that Christians defend the biblical worldview of creation? Well, first of all, of course, at Creation Worldview Ministries, we are putting out a Christian biblical worldview. And I stress that because there are people who are not Christian who have a biblical worldview. Jews have a biblical worldview, but it's not Christian. And so we stress a Christian biblical worldview. Now, understand that the age of the earth, the age of the universe, I believe, biblically and scientifically, is only 6,000 years old. And I would defend that. There are nearly 300 geochronometers, scientific time clocks, to prove that the Earth and the universe are less than 10,000 years old, consistent with 6,000. Now, from a biblical standpoint, all we need to do is look at the genealogy in Luke of Mary, through her father, back to King David, back to Adam, back to God. Clearly, the Bible teaches 6,000 years of age, approximately. And we have good science to back it up. I want to stipulate, however, that the acceptance of a young earth is not the salvation issue. You know, the salvation issue is, do you know Christ? Have you accepted his work on the cross, etc., correct? That's right. However, however, a young earth is incredibly important, but it is not the salvation issue. The reason that it is so important theologically is because if you believe in millions and billions of years, if a person is a theistic evolutionist, someone who believes that God does exist, but that he has created what we see today through a slow and gradual process over millions and billions of supposed years, we have six theological major problems. Because if you believe that, you are saying God is not omniscient, nor is he omnipotent. He is not smart enough, he is not strong enough to bring it into existence whole, complete, and perfect. You're saying that he is a weak God. You're saying that he cannot save a remnant. You're calling God a liar, because that's not the way he says he did it. He says he did it in six literal 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. And that is not only recorded in the book of Genesis, but if we take a look at the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, in the middle of the giving of the Ten Commandments, God says, You shall work six literal 24-hour days and rest one, because I worked six literal 24-hour days and rested one when I created the earth and the universe. You are saying that God does not always have a witness, but the God of the Bible says, I always have a witness. But number six is far and away the single most important reason. If you believe that life and death have been going on for billions or millions of supposed years, you are saying that the death of a nefesh organism, now the word nefesh is Hebrew, but it means life, soul, or blood, and is translated that way in Genesis, all three ways. We find it in Genesis 2, 7, God breathed the breath of life and the flesh into the body of Adam. Well, if you believe that there have been millions and billions of supposed years prior to humans, you are saying that the organisms, things that have soul, life, blood, died before human sin. The organisms include cats, dogs, horses, cows, dinosaurs, and people. Now, if nefesh organisms were dying before human sin, then human sin is not the causative agent for death to come into the universe. If that is true, you might as well take the book of Romans and tear it out of your Bible. In Romans 5, God clearly tells us that it is through the sin of the first man, Adam, that death came into the universe, the death of the nefesh organism. And the same thing also we find in Corinthians, too, but that it was the death that came into the universe as a consequence, as, as a result of human sin, and that the death of the second Adam, Jesus Christ, conquers and does away with death. Now, 
if death occurred before human sin, human sin is not the causative agent, therefore death would be common. There's nothing special about it. Human sin didn't cause it. If that is true, then the death of Christ on the cross is meaningless. It is simply another man dying. And if death is common, there's nothing special about his death either. And therefore, while it is not the salvation issue, it becomes critically important to Christian theology. Well, in order to be a theistic evolutionist, which sounds like an oxymoron to me, but it means you do not believe the creation account in the book of Genesis. And therefore, if That's right. if, if Genesis is wrong, then the rest of the Bible is wrong. Well, a theistic evolutionist chooses not to believe in the first chapters, the first eleven chapters of Genesis, or they want to believe that they can rewrite it, that they can insert millions and billions of years in it in one of different ways: the day-age theory, the gap theory, the allegory theory, the framework theory, are attempts by Christians, whether met, well, and, and let's give them credit, maybe they're well-meaning but they are attempting to put evolutionary time into the Bible where it does not exist. And they are rewriting the Bible, and they are saying things like, I have the intelligence to decide which parts of the Bible I will accept and which parts are wrong, which ones that I reject. When the truth of the matter is, they have no right to do so whatsoever. We either accept the Bible as God's holy word from beginning to end, or we reject it. But if you think your intelligence is capable of choosing when to begin, when to end, what to keep, what to reject, you are saying that your intelligence is above God's intelligence. When evolution was first introduced, it was referred to as a theory. Over time, it became a scientific fact in the minds of the proponents of evolution. Today, it's become dogma. And uh, if you dare question it, uh, you will be ridiculed off the stage, out of your job. Professors will be denied tenure. Um, the list goes on of the punishment that, that the establishment will, will impose on anybody who questions evolution. How, how has the acceptance of evolution changed society well, it's very simple. Again, uh, my ministry is Creation Worldview Ministries. And so, what is a worldview? Why do we stress that word? A worldview is like a lens through which you see the world. But the shape, the prescription of your lens is going to be based upon your acceptance of creation or evolution. If you start with a creation foundation based in the Bible, then the shape or prescription of your lens allows you that when you look through that, you are going to say that abortion and euthanasia are murder. That suicide, of course, is wrong. Racism is wrong. School violence, family breakup is wrong. But if your foundation of thinking is based in the acceptance of evolution, then that changes the shape or the prescription of your lens. And therefore, when you look through that lens, you're going to say abortion, euthanasia, they're fine. Uh, homosexuality, lawlessness, racism, school violence, it's fine. And so what you believe about where you came from, the question of origins, creation or evolution, will ultimately determine what you believe about where you're going, what you believe about why you're here, what you believe about how you should behave while you're here. And so... This, this is the ultimately important question. What do you believe about where you came from will ultimately determine what you believe about where you're going. If you believe that you came from mud to man, you believe that when you die, you're going to go back to mud, you're going to cease to exist. In this lifetime, you answer to no higher authority. Uh, if it feels good, do it. Uh, you can do anything because there's no laws, there's no absolutes, there's no roles, there's no rules, there's no standards of conduct, and there is no purpose. But if you accept creation as truth, then you understand that, in fact, there are laws, absolutes, rules, roles, standards of conduct, and purpose. If you think about some of the things that are going on today in our society, you need to read Paul's letter to the evolutionists. 
Paul's letter to the evolutionists begins in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and goes to the end of the chapter. And Paul is writing a letter to the evolutionists. And he says about the evolutionists that there are those people who will suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, I spent 20 years of my life being taught by men and women who suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. They knew evolution was wrong, but they taught it to me anyway. And Paul says that the invisible God is made known to everyone, that every human being, even the atheist, does know that God exists. He just won't admit it openly. Paul says the invisible God is made known to us through the things that he has made. He uses the classical argument for the existence of God, the argument by design, that when you see design, you know there's a designer. Now, there is more complexity in one tree in the complexity of all the structures built by man in Vero Beach. If you take a look at all the wiring, the plumbing, the structures, the street signs, the pavement, there's more complexity in one tree than there is in the entire town, city of Vero Beach. Now, think with me for a second. If I can see that kind of complexity in one tree, then it tells me there's a tree maker. When you see a chair, you know there is a chair maker. But have you ever seen the chair maker? Well, no, the chair maker is invisible to me. I've never seen him. But I know the chair maker does exist because of the evidence that they left behind the chair, correct? That's right. And Paul says everybody knows God exists because the human mind intrinsically knows the difference between randomness and design. And when you see design, you know there's a designer. And that was Paul's argument in Romans 1. But Paul goes on to say that evolutionists profess to be wise, but, and I quote Paul, I did not say this, Paul wrote this. Evolutionists proclaim to be wise, great wisdom, they pontificate, they say, we know what we are talking about, believe us. But Paul says, professing to be wise, they became mentally useless. Because they deny the obvious existence of a designer when they see design, they intentionally choose not to believe what is obviously true. Evolution is a religion. It is not a science. It is believed in by faith, not in substance. And the reason they believe it is that they want to deny the existence of God because they do not want there to be absolutes, laws, rules, roles, standards of conduct, or purpose. They want to believe that they are nothing but thinking animals. And if people are nothing but thinking animals, then they can do anything they want without consequence, because when an animal dies, they cease to exist, and they do not answer to a higher authority. But the Bible tells us, quite frankly, that we do have consequences, that there is an authority, that God is the king of the universe, he is the judge of the universe, and there will be a judgment. And Paul goes on further. He says, what are the consequences of what happens when people accept evolution instead of creation in spite of the evidence? Well, he goes on to say that they worship the creation rather than the creator. They stop short. And the consequences go to the end of the chapter. I will only list four of those consequences in the order, but I will put them in the order they occur. He says, women become lesbians, men become homosexuals, they become murderers. This includes abortion, euthanasia, suicide. And later on, he says, they become disobedient to parents. Now, I would challenge anyone in the audience to think, as we teach evolution more and more in our public schools, universities, secular institutions, what do we see more of in our society? Do we not see more lesbians, homosexuals, murderers, including school violence, for instance, um, cyberbullying, that's in the news just recently, uh, and more disobedience to parents? This is the natural consequence of teaching evolution only in our schools. Dr. McMurtry, in in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, in the 14th chapter, chapter, uh, Scripture refers to to three angels that are crying out in the last days. Um, the third angel is 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 saying, "Do not uh, worship the beast and his image. Do not receive the mark in his head." The second angel says, "Babylon has fallen," but the first angel says, "Fear God and give glory to Him." For the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him 
that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Is there a end time ministry in the last days that will return the church to a f- focus on worshiping God as the Creator? Well, as a matter of fact, that's a verse that I often teach about. And think about it. It says that there's an angel of God who has the eternal gospel. And that angel is going to preach it to those people who live on the surface of the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. If you think about it, those are the same four categories that are used, Genesis chapter 10, Genesis chapter 11, to refer to the 17 nations that come from the Tower of Babel experience. Now, please notice that at the end of verse 6, there is not a period. It is a comma. Verse 7 is a continuation of the same sentence. And so verse 6 is painting a word picture. It's an action taking place. An angel flying through the mid-heaven, the first atmosphere, preaching the gospel to those who live on the surface of the earth. But in verse 7, he says, what is the eternal gospel? And as you said, he says, worship the one who made all those things. Now, let us substitute equal words for just a moment. Isn't the one who made all those things the creator? And the entire eternal gospel comes down to worship the creator. We have a creature-creator relationship with God. He made us. He made us with a purpose, and that purpose is to have fellowship with him. Now, when people reject their purpose, they go flying off into man-made religions called evolution. And the word worship that is used in the book of Revelation, as you know, both in the Old Testament, New Testament, Hebrew, and Greek, the word worship translated there can also mean serve. Therefore, the entire eternal gospel is serve the Creator or worship the Creator. You could translate it correctly either way. And so, again, it's that worldview lens based in creation that gives us the right view of the world and the right view of the supernatural as well. Amen. And um, and I think this is, uh, this is the message that the, the Church needs to return to. It is that in eternal Rick, gospel. Rick, without creation, there is no Christianity. That's right. And there's no, repeat, there's no well, need. Without the, doctrine, without the doctrine of creation, there is no viable Christianity. Without creation, you cannot understand sin. Without creation, you cannot understand that human death is the causative agent for death. So, you know, without the viable doctrine of creation, there is no viable Christianity. And without understanding creation, there is no reason for the Son of God to come to earth in human flesh and die on a cross. And that is... Yes, sir. And that's what I said earlier. If the first Adam, sin, did not cause death to come into the universe, then the second Adam's death cannot conquer it. And that... Sir, is at the heart of why the God-haters are so determined to teach and preach evolution, because it's really about turning people away from God the Creator. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. If, If you think philosophically for just a moment, there's nothing new about evolutionary theory. And I would point out to you, there is no such thing as the theory of evolution. There are a million different theories of evolution, because no two evolutionists agree on exactly how it happened, but they all agree it's true. However, if we go back 2,000 years ago, the first century church was having to deal with the scientific conflict between creation and evolution. In Romans chapter 1, Acts chapter 17, 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter and Paul are dealing with a scientific conflict between creation and evolution because the Greek and Roman philosophers have been teaching evolution for 600 years before Christ was born. And those Greek and Roman philosophers of 2,000 to 2,600 years ago were teaching exactly the same thing that evolutionists are teaching today. And I mean exactly. 
they taught that one kind became many kinds. They taught that life started in the ocean and walked down to the land. They taught that fish evolved into people, that fish walked onto the land, became apes, and eventually people. That is exactly what evolutionists are teaching today in our universities, colleges, schools. I was now, I was surprised to to discover that, when, and I first learned it when I was reading uh, the various writings of the early church fathers from the you know first uh, one two three four centuries, and they were dealing with these issues. And I, 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 you know, I just laughed when I was reading it, saying, you know, this is the same old lie. It's been around for thousands of years. Now, I, I want to kind of elaborate on that, but it does go back farther. I mean, there were Greek and Roman philosophers before Christ was born, before Paul walked into Athens, who were teaching about atomic theory. Now, we know more about the atom than they knew then, but the Greeks did understand the basics of atomic theory. And there were Greek philosophers who said that the existence of the universe was due to uh, changes in uh, atoms, fluctuations. Well, Dr. Stephen Hawking last year said that God was not necessary because we are the result of a quantum fluctuation of virtual particles. Now, that is just modern termination, the the same kind of thing that they were teaching 2,000 years ago, which is modern terminology. That's exactly what the Greek philosophers were teaching 2,300 years ago. And if you go back to the book of Judges, now that's 3,000 to 3,400 years ago, the 400 years between Joshua and King Saul. In chapter 17, chapter 21, it says that when they had no one to rule over them, each man, each woman did what was right in their own eyes or sight. Now that is denying the existence of a lawgiver. It's an evolutionary philosophical view it says there is no lawgiver, therefore each person may write their own rules. But it goes back, philosophically, evolution goes back to the Garden of Eden. It is the first deception of Satan. Because the first deception of Satan was, hath God said? Did the Creator really say that? No, he didn't really mean that. You can't trust him. He just knows that if you knew what he knew, then you would be just like him. And Satan deceives Adam and Eve into eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had commanded them not to do. And he did it by appealing to them through a deception that God is not really the creator God, that evolution is true, that they just came about by random chance, and that this man who had talked with them named God wasn't telling the truth, and you can't trust him. He just thinks that if you knew what he knew, then you'd be like him. Can can you so answer? Can, can you answer? And in, in, we got like three or four minutes remaining. Can you answer the question in three or four minutes? Why did God put the tree there and then tell Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of it? Absolutely, it's exactly the same reason that God, the Holy Spirit, had to seal the door on the outside of the Ark of Noah. It was to prove there's nothing you can do to save yourself that salvation is not the gift of works, it's the gift of grace. If Adam and Eve could have obeyed God's law, God would give them only one rule in the garden. He said, you can do anything, including eating the fruit of the tree of life, which speaks of eternal fellowship with God. Just don't eat of that one tree. Now, if Adam and Eve could have had the willpower not to eat of that one tree, they would still be alive, theoretically. They would have lived immortal in a physical body, which was actually God's original intent, that they would live alive in an immortal body, uh, having fellowship with him in a perfect state, a perfect creation. But he gave them 100% free will also, and he knew ahead of time that if he gave them that 100% free will, that they would mess up, because he already had the plan of salvation in place before the physical universe came into existence. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain since before the foundation of the world. And so God's plan was already there, because he knew people given free will would sin. And he gave them only one rule to prove there was absolutely nothing you can do to save yourself. In the same way, the Holy Spirit sealed the door on the outside of the ark 
to prove that Noah and the seven others with him, who could seal the door on the inside but could not do it on the outside for themselves, that in spite of following God's instructions, building the ark, loading the ark, there was still nothing that they could do to save themselves. It was the gift of grace. And we're going to let that be the final word. My uh, guest today, Dr. Grady McMurtry, is the president and founder of Creation Worldview. The website is creationworldview.org. And for those of us, uh, our listeners, if you're in the state of Maryland, uh, Dr. McMurtry is speaking tonight at uh, Waldorf Grace Brethren Church, Waldorf, Maryland. And uh, he will be in Bonita Springs, Florida uh, next week. And then... Uh, real close to us, Melbourne. You'll be at uh, Harbor Christian Church in Melbourne, Florida, October 24th, 26th. Um, very extensive schedule, speaking all over the nation. You can go to the website creationworldview.org, and you can see the um, upcoming events where he will be lecturing. And uh, I'm sure many of our listeners uh, will definitely turn out to hear Dr. McMurtry speak. Sir, thank you. Appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you, Rick. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Once you understand how much God loves you, it's time to respond. Dr. Stanley prays for us in today's moment with Charles Stanley. Father, we love you and praise you this morning. We pray the Holy Spirit will strike a heart of conviction that we say so little about the most important person who ever walked on the face of this earth. The only person who's made it possible for us to be acceptable in your sight. The only person who's made it possible for us to die and go to heaven. The only person who's made it possible for our body to be resurrected from the grave. The only person who's given us promise of life beyond this one. And the only one who's given us the hope and the promise and the assurance of everlasting and eternal life. Thank you, dear God, for having such great desires for us. And I pray in Jesus' name that those who are listening, those who are watching, those who are seated right here, who've never trusted Jesus as their Savior, might recognize He's their only hope and be wise enough to receive Him as their Savior and their Lord. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. To learn more about salvation and how to live a life of faith, log on to InTouch.org and click All Things Are New. Well, let's close the program by reading from the 14th chapter of the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Coffee. Coffee, no!